Tonight, brace for impact. A major storm is working its way up the East Coast, bringing heavy snow, ice, and nightmare travel the weekend before Christmas. I'm Katie Couric. The Washington area could get 20 inches of snow, so the president's returning early from Copenhagen. That's where global warming is on the agenda and where delegates took what's called an historic step forward to fight it. A troubling new report about autism. There's been a sharp increase in the number of children who have it. Why? And a worldwide tapestry of children without hope now woven into American families thanks to the orphan doctor. This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. Good evening, everyone. Winter will officially begin on Monday, but much of the East Coast is about to get a preview. A big storm that caused serious flooding in the south is now heading north with ice and snow and getting stronger. All kinds of weather alerts are up, including blizzard warnings from North Carolina to New Hampshire. We'll be talking with CBS Early Show weather anchor Dave Price in just a moment. But first, national correspondent Jeff Clore. And Jeff, this is going to be tough the weekend before Christmas. It will indeed, Katie, including for those who clean up the snow. We're standing in the salt piles here in New York City. Forecasters say this storm could be monumental with the potential to impact up to 50 million people. It began with torrential downpours in the southeast. A whopping 14 inches of rain in South Florida, taking many by surprise. The houses have been converted into islands. And that was only the beginning, as what falls changes from rain to snow. In some cases, enormous amounts of it. From a coating in Asheville, North Carolina, to what could be more than two feet of snow in the Washington, D.C. area. We have very well-established plans to move essential workers, medical doctors and others, to their jobs during this snowstorm. Up to 13 inches is expected in Philadelphia, up to 10 inches in New York City. This is going to be a really bad storm. Again, the difference between somebody getting a foot or two of snow and maybe, say, six inches is could be just by a few miles. At least three major airlines are letting customers fly earlier than expected this weekend without penalty, hoping to avoid an airport crunch. And as towns and cities up and down the East Coast get roads ready for holiday shoppers and retailers, the timing could not be much worse. A storm on the last Saturday before Christmas when up to a billion dollars in goods was expected to trade hands. But snow always has a negative impact. It'll always keep shoppers from actually traveling out, and particularly on the first day of a snowstorm. Retail experts say bad weather typically drops sales 10 percent, but if more than two feet drops in some spots, it could clearly get worse. I think if people are desperate enough to buy that last-minute gift, they're going to go out in the snow regardless. <laughs> This is clearly a storm that will be tough to avoid. And while, as we said, some in the south were surprised, clearly towns and cities now in the north have advance warning. This will be a long weekend. Katie? All right. Jeff Glor. Jeff, thanks very much. Dave Price from The Early Show is working late today. And Dave, what is the genesis of this storm? Well, the storm is the same system that brought all of that moisture to the Gulf states and Florida, some of it record setting. Now it's beginning to move north at about 25 miles per hour. It's going to pick up some Atlantic moisture at this point and more precipitation and more energy as it becomes really a monster storm and begins to work in the direction of the northeast coastline. Computer models this morning really did agree, but now they're beginning to get some consensus. And where we're going to see moisture meet that cold air over the Carolinas, we're going to see snow. Some of it could be record setting. Greenville should see between three and five inches of snow today. Roanoke, Virginia, 15 to 18 inches of snow as we head tonight through into the midday Saturday. Washington, D.C., 14 to 20 inches overnight through tomorrow. Philadelphia getting blistered as well with 10 to 14 and even 10 to 12 in New York City. Boston a little tricky at this point because we don't know how sharp a turn the storm's going to make into the Atlantic. Winds 15 to 25 miles per hour. We could see blowing and drifting snow in blizzard conditions occasionally in some sections. The northeast is going to get hammered, Katie. Sounds brutal, except for little kids who want to go sledding probably. Meanwhile, what about next week? Will this clear up by then? Because so many people will be traveling before Christmas. Well, keep in mind, it's not so much going to be a travel issue, but it is going to stay cold. So many areas in the northeast 
are going to get that white Christmas they were hoping for. Katie? All right. Dave Price, Dave, thanks very much. As we mentioned earlier, with all that snow headed for Washington, President Obama left the climate change summit in Copenhagen early, heading home before a final vote. The president said progress was made in intensive talks with China's prime minister and other world leaders. But it's far from the deal many were hoping for. Here's Sheila McVicker. After a day of disarray and disagreement, five countries, including the U.S., did finally approve a plan to verify efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But ultimately, they didn't get what they really came here for, a legally binding treaty among all countries to make concrete cuts to gas emissions and curb global warming. Tonight, President Obama acknowledged there is much more work to do. This is going to be hard. Now, this is hard within countries. Uh, it's going to be even harder between countries. It was an extraordinary end to a frustrating day that capped two years of negotiations, finally stalling over one country, China, and its initial refusal to accept international monitoring over its emission cuts. The U.S. had called any lack of transparency a deal breaker. When Obama spoke this morning, his message was directed at Chinese leaders. We are ready to get this done today. But there has to be movement on all sides to recognize that it is better for us to act than to talk. It was this meeting between Obama and the Chinese premier that was meant to break the deadlock. The body language said it all. After 55 minutes, the Chinese refused to budge and undiplomatic finger pointing started. Said the French president, what's stopping us reaching a deal is China. Tempers flared as Obama prepared for a second meeting with the Chinese. No press. No press, please. No animal. Okay, hold on. I got to get my American guys in because everybody else got in. My guys have to get in just like your guys have to get in. All right? My guys get in just like your guys got in. This is a joint meeting. My guys get in or we're leaving the meeting. In the end, after endless meetings, there was hope that a crucial step had been taken to deal with climate change. I'm always hopeful. The president called the plan reached with China, India and others to list the actions they will take to curb global warming a meaningful breakthrough. But he also said there are fundamental deadlocks and perspectives between rich nations and poor. Katie? Sheila McVicker in Copenhagen tonight. Sheila, thank you. Now to an alarming new report about autism and the growing number of American children who have it. A study out today says that in 2006, one Eight-year-old out of every 110 was diagnosed with autism or a related disorder. That's a 57% jump over just four years. Dr. Jennifer Ashton explains what these numbers mean. Are there elephants on a farm? To draw an accurate portrait of autism in America, the CDC spent years examining medical and educational records. The picture that emerged is startling. We identified more children because we had more evaluations, we had better descriptions, and we had more information that help us, helped us show that the symptoms of autism were present. The CDC studied the records of over 300,000 eight-year-olds in parts of 11 states from 2006, looking for a diagnosis or symptoms of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. ASD refers to a group of symptoms including a profound inability to communicate, mental retardation, and other developmental disorders from mild to severe. Diagnosis can be complicated and subjective. It's not like we're going out and measuring a blood test. It isn't concrete like that. This is looking at behavior. Boys are still four to five times more likely than girls to be diagnosed, and estimates are that one in 70 boys are affected. In analyzing the numbers, researchers are wrestling with an important issue. Are there really more autistic children, or does the growing awareness of the symptoms lead to more diagnosis? Based on everything we have right now, I would say it's more likely than not that there is an increase in the number of cases. It's not absolute. We learn more, we ask more, we find more. Jennifer Chancellor has been a special education teacher for 14 years. She's seen a big change in perceptions of children's behavior. I think that there's an awareness of what developmental milestones should be hit for children. And I think that when their children, or there's concern that their children may not be meeting those milestones, 
then parents are asking physicians and physicians are directing them to their educators. But the report says most interventions are still happening too late. Parents often report noticing symptoms at less than two years of age, but the diagnosis of autism is still not happening until many children are about four and a half, which is too late for the very best treatments, Katie. And Jennifer, I know 30 years ago, one in every 2,000 children was diagnosed as having autism. Now it's one in every 110. Given these startling statistics, why don't we understand better what causes autism? Well, the thinking, Katie, is that there's not a single cause, but really multiple factors at play. And those can range from an older age of the father at the time of conception to environmental triggers to other genetic causes. Bottom line is we still have a lot to learn about this. All right. Dr. Jennifer Ashton, thanks so much, Jennifer. To learn more, you can go to our partner in health coverage, WebMD.com, and search autism. Now to the battle over health care reform. Democrats are still trying to get the elusive 60th vote they need to pass a bill. It takes 60 votes to cut off a filibuster. And Nancy Cordes tells us Republicans are doing everything they can to block the bill, including delaying tactics in this race against the clock. As he was wheeled into the Senate chamber shortly after 1 a.m., 92-year-old Robert Byrd made it clear how he felt about being pulled out of bed to vote. Shame. Shame. His ire was directed at Republicans who intentionally dragged out debate on a defense spending bill, hoping that in turn would hold up the health care bill Democrats desperately want to pass before Christmas. Not even the darkness outside can conceal the game being played inside this Senate chamber. It's one of several stalling tactics Republicans have employed in recent days, and they're not apologizing. I don't think anybody in the room's missed it. We don't think this bill ought to pass, and we're not in a hurry to, to, to uh, complete it. With just 40 senators, Republicans don't have the power to stop the health care bill, just delay it. What's the point of forcing these votes to be held at the dead of night on Christmas Eve, why not just move along? Well, why don't the Democrats say, look, look, let's sit down, let's work this out. Wouldn't that be the way to do it? They can do anything they want to, and they found that, hey, that isn't the way it goes. Especially not with a midterm election year right around the corner. What you do is you make the, 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 the majority party, the people allegedly in control, look inept, and then you run against them for not being able to accomplish anything. This is standard uh, politics, politics 101. But Republicans won't need to bother stalling if Democrats can't negotiate an abortion compromise with their lone remaining holdout, pro-life Nebraska Senator Ben Nelson. And there are other problems. Senators still haven't seen the bill or the changes to it, and they still don't know how much it will cost. Nancy Cordes, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Bob Schieffer is our chief Washington correspondent and anchor of Face the Nation. Bob, we, all week long we've heard about the twists and turns of health care reform in the Senate. What do you think is going to happen to this bill? You know, uh, this is some remarkable insight I'm going to give you, Katie, but no one can really say. No one knows, except for the fact that they are talking about spending our tax dollars. Uh, this is the part you just want to close your eyes and not look. What's going on now is not crafting a better bill. It's not even about health care. This is about partisanship, about getting votes, about backroom deals. It's about politics. The Republicans are against everything. They don't know what's in the bill, but they're against it, so they're trying to slow everything down. Democrats want to get it passed. They don't know what's in the bill either, but they're for most of it. So they're trying to counter the Republican slowdown by putting the Senate on a 24-hour schedule. They had a vote at 1 o'clock this morning. They're going to have another one at 7 o'clock tomorrow. You've got liberal Democrats attacking the president for giving up too much. You've got Rush Limbaugh attacking the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, for being too soft. At this point, it appears the Democrats are one, maybe two votes away from having the votes to pass this bill. But no one can be certain. No one can say exactly what's in it, how much it's going to cost. What we're hearing, seeing here tonight, Katie, is the legislative process at its very worst. And it really is like watching <laughs> sausage being made, isn't it? Bob Schieffer, Bob, thanks so much. And Bob will have more about the health care debate this Sunday on Face the Nation. His guests include Republican Senator Olympia Snow of Maine. And coming up next here on the CBS Evening News, it's a symbol of the horror the world vowed never to forget. And now it's been stolen.
Auschwitz was the scene of one of the greatest horrors the world has ever known. And tonight there is outrage around the world after someone stole the sign at the entrance to the World War II Nazi death camp. The camp in Poland was left standing after the war and the sign remained a painful but important reminder of what happened there and the vow that it would never happen again. Richard Roth has more. In a place of horror and suffering, it was the infamous motto of Nazi cruelty. Arching over the entry to Auschwitz, a 16-foot-long iron sign that said, work sets you free. At dawn today, it was missing, stolen, according to Polish police, by thieves who entered Auschwitz through a gap in a wall overnight and cut through barbed wire to get away. A profanity, said a spokesman for the Auschwitz Museum. It is unbelievable, sad, and frustrating. A replica of the 90-pound sign was quickly bolted into place, but the theft was condemned as sacrilege by survivors of the Holocaust. When we that have been their prisoners shall not be more. Auschwitz is a symbol. You can see there what happened. What did happen beyond the sign with its cynical slogan promising freedom through work was the biggest mass murder in history. More than a million prisoners, mostly Jews, died in this Nazi death camp between 1940 and 1945, many of them exterminated in gas chambers. With age and weather wearing on Auschwitz, there'd just been agreement on money to preserve this memorial. It's impossible to imagine who'd steal the sign, said Poland's chief rabbi, but whoever did has vandalized world memory. Richard Roth, CBS News, London. Finally tonight, the number of Americans adopting children from overseas is down sharply. A new report from the State Department says such adoptions fell 27 percent in the past year to the lowest level in 15 years. Tonight, the story of a woman trying to make foreign adoptions easier for both parents and children as Michelle Miller brings us the American spirit. Inside her tiny office on New York's Upper East Side, Say, uh, Dr. Jane Aronson is a modern-day medicine woman, a caretaker not only to her patients here, Thank you. You're welcome, sis. but also an ambassador to thousands more overseas, uniting little souls with American parents seeking to give them a home. From Dylan, who arrived from Moldova just a few weeks ago, give me knuckles, baby. to Cece, right. born in China. While international adoption can offer potential parents more options, newly adopted children often have physical ailments. This is a boy, huh? These are children who are born small and somewhat immune compromised. And then they living in developing nations where there's risks of tuberculosis, parasites, exposure to hepatitis. The 58-year-old infectious disease specialist gained worldwide attention after treating Angelina Jolie's daughter, Zahara, from a life-threatening bacterial infection shortly after she arrived from Ethiopia. Dr. Aronson also provides an antidote for emotional issues as well. I've spent the last 20 years traveling to orphanages all over the world to see the conditions that kids grow up in. I know when they arrive here how hurt and sad and empty and how yearning they are you know, to love. And Dr. Aronson isn't immune. It's why she helps new moms like Nanette Green bond with their daughters. She didn't see me as somebody that was going to take her and be her mama for the rest of her life. But not anymore, thanks in part to Dr. Jane's guidance. Recently, Glamour magazine named her one of its Women of the Year, recognizing her work through the Worldwide Orphans Foundation. She started it 12 years ago to provide health care and a healthier life to children left orphaned by disease, war, and starvation. She is a miracle worker. The adoption guru has brought her work home. She and her partner, Diana, adopted two sons, 11-year-old Des from Ethiopia and 9-year-old Ben from Vietnam. Kids w would want a family with do anything to have what all of us have, a family who takes care of them, loves them, and gives them hugs at night and tucks them in bed. And in this holiday season, families who've already given light to an unwanted child say there's no greater gift. Michelle Miller, CBS News, New York.
And before we leave you tonight, I'd like to say farewell to a friend and competitor. Charlie Gibson is signing off for the last time tonight as anchor of ABC's World News. Charlie, to borrow a line from you, I hope you had a good day and many more to come. I'm Kitty Couric. Good night.